Hey, everybody. This is Alicia Purdy, publisher of The Way of the Worshipper. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm reading the Bible through in a year. Today is day 88 of our one-year Bible reading plan. Fantastic journey through God's word so far and so much more to come. Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms, and Proverbs every day. And by the end of this year, 365 days of God's word, you will never be the same. And neither will I. I'm reading the Bible through in a year just like you are. And I'm so glad we're together on this journey. Before we get into our Bible reading for today, make sure you hit the thumbs up button at the bottom of this video and all the videos to keep yourself accountable. And it's a great way that you and I can partner together as ministers of the gospel, advancing the kingdom of God online. The word of God goes forth. It is, does not return empty. God is faithful to watch over his word, to see it accomplished. Accomplished. That's Jeremiah 1 12. And I believe that with all my heart. So this is part of my mission as a writer and a journalist is to see more of Jesus online. I believe God's word is the only source of truth in existence and has true power through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit to transform all lives. Make a point to check out the resources below as well for continued study and devotional processing as we read through the Bible. Sometimes things come up and I put them down below so that you can continue forward and we can continue reading the Bible together through in a year. So we're going to open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the reading of your word. Father, we believe that your word is the only source of truth in existence. And we want to hide that truth in our heart that we might not sin against you, that we have a word in season to speak to those who are suffering or those who are lost. Father, come and have your way in us today. We are your followers. We are committed to you, Father, because you loved us. We believe, Father, that your word goes forth and it does not return empty. It accomplishes what you sent it to do. Help us today, Lord, as we have conversations and we interact throughout our day to re be reminded of your word that we speak your words instead of our own words of life, words of hope, words of faith in the Lord. You are worthy to be praised, Father. You are a good God. And we thank you for that. When life is hard, we can run to you who are good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so continuing on today in the book of Deuteronomy, reading today Deuteronomy 9 and 10. When we last left off, we had covered Deuteronomy 8, which was such a beautiful chapter with the words of the Lord talking about his purpose for bringing people out of their slavery, breaking their bonds, bringing them out from among those who were tormenting them. We see that God says here, it's for our good always that he might preserve us. It's because he's kept covenant with those that he loved all the way back in our spiritual history. And he said that through the wilderness, we become humbled and proven to know what is in our hearts. Walk, Keep the commandments of the Lord, walk in his ways, fear him. You will not lack anything. It was so wonderful to see God's heart shine through, but you must remember the Lord, your God. That's what he said. Those who are with me are the ones that are under my covering, my protection. And those who are not have placed themselves under the law of sin and death. And certainly it is filled with death and troubles and traumas of every kind because sin is the enemy of God. And when we choose to sin, we position ourselves, spiritually speaking, against God. I don't want that. I know that we're just flawed human beings, but through Christ, we have the better covenant and the new covenant. Yes and amen. But this is a foreshadowing of the way that people experience sin, interact with sin, the consequences of sin all the way back here. These are literal tellings of what people went through. And yet today, the principles still remain the same under the new covenant. Sin positions us against God, but, but, and God was very clear in our past readings through Deuteronomy, but he said, even in the worst things that you could do, you could still call on him. We saw that as well. And that is God's mercy. This whole book is a testimony of Jesus Christ, who is God's mercy. So let's continue on. This is Moses. Uh, these chapters we're in De Deuteronomy is Moses retelling the narrative of all the people have walked through over the 40 years. And at this point in time, all those people are dead, but he's recounting the conversations and the situations to the new generation who is about to go into the land of Canaan and take possession. So Moses is speaking again, telling them. 
Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today to go in to possess nations greater, greater and mightier than you, great cities fortified up to heaven, a great and tall people, the children of the Anakites whom you know and of whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the children of Anak? The children of Anak were a race of giants, and they were only one family, one uh, civilization of several races of giants. Some of them were the sons of Anak. Others were the sons of Gath. We saw ones called the Rephidim. These are all people that are humongous. Goliath of Gath was somewhere around nine feet tall, and these were not people with a pituitary problem. These were actually a race of human beings that were giants. And so the people that were terrified when they first saw the spies went in and they spied out, they said, those people are giants. And now it's become a saying who can stand before the children of Anak. Understand therefore today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you as a consuming fire. He shall destroy them. And bring them down before you so that you drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord has spoken to you. Do not say in your heart after the Lord has driven them out from before you, on account of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess the land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord is driving them out before you. It is not because of your righteousness or the upright of your heart that you entered to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out before you, that he may fulfill the word he swore to your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess on account of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn people. Remember and do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that you departed out of the land of Egypt until you came to this place. You have been rebellious against the Lord. Also in Horeb, you provoked the Lord in wrath so that the Lord was angry enough with you to destroy you. When I went up into the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant, which the Lord made with you, and then I remained on the mountain 40 nights and 40 days, I did not eat bread or drink water. The Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them was written all the words which the Lord spoke to you at the mountain out of the midst of the fire on that day of the assembly. At the end of 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord gave me two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. Then the Lord said to me, Arise and go down from here quickly, for your people whom you've brought out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They are quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them, and they've made a molded image for themselves. Furthermore, the Lord spoke to me, saying, I have seen this people, and indeed, they are a stubborn people. Let me alone, so that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make you a nation mightier and greater than they. So I returned and came down from the mount, and the mount burned with fire, and the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands. I looked, and indeed you had sinned before the Lord your God. You had made yourself a molded calf. You had quickly turned aside out of the way which the Lord commanded you. I took the two tablets, and I threw them out of my hands and broke them before your eyes. I fell down before the Lord as at the first Forty days and forty nights. I did not eat bread or drink water because of all your sins which you committed, doing what was wicked in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure with which the Lord was wrathful against you to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me at that time also. The Lord was angry enough with Aaron to destroy him. So I also prayed for Aaron at the same time. I took your sin, the calf which you made, and burned it with fire and crushed it and ground it very small until it was as small as dust. Then I threw the dust into the brook that descended down from the mountain. Also at Tabarah and at Massah and at Kibroth HaTavah, you provoked the Lord to wrath. Likewise, when the Lord sent you up from Kadesh Barnea, saying, go up and possess the land which I have given you, then you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and you did not believe him, nor did you listen to him. You have been rebellious to the Lord from the day I knew you.
So I fell down before the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. I fell down because the Lord had said he would destroy you. I prayed therefore to the Lord and said, oh Lord, God, do not destroy your people, your inheritance, which you've redeemed your greatness, which you've brought out from Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not look at the stubbornness of this people or at their wickedness or their sin. Otherwise, the land from which you brought them may say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land, which he promised them. And because he hated them, he's brought them out to slay them in the wilderness. Yet they are your people, your inheritance, whom you brought out by your mighty power and by your outstretched arm. Moses is recounting these words in this account, all that has happened up until this point. And I'm going to underline this here. I like what he says, that you have been rebellious since the day that I knew you. That's very interesting. And why has God contended with them this long? Certainly they have tested and tried God and God is entitled to whatever temper that he wants because it is righteous anger. When it comes to the Lord, we sometimes compare our own unrighteous anger and our own sinful, vengeful wrath. We project that onto the holiness of God and it's wrong. God, even in his wrath, is holy and righteous and merciful. There's no comparing human anger and wrath and revenge and vengeance to God's relationship with sin, his enemy, where his wrath is violently toward and the people who choose the path of that wrath. So Moses says over here that it wasn't because they are so special that God is saving. It's because of his love for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, two very, three very flawed people we've seen throughout our readings, but he loved them and they loved him. And we saw over and over and over. These were people, real people who worshiped the Lord, who continually ran to the Lord, whose heart was to honor the Lord. And yes, they made human choices and mistakes, but their, their heart was before God. No one compelled them. There was no books of the law. It was from their heart that they offered sacrifices of worship and praise to the Lord and honored him with sacrifices. They did not need to do that. And no one told them to. They did it willingly. And it drew God's attention amongst all the pagans of the wicked, wicked world. So it's not because they're so special. It's because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were special, and these are their inheritance. And I love what Moses says when he is intervening without food and water for 40 days and 40 nights. Hey, Jesus did that too. We see in Matthew chapter four, without food and water for 40 days and 40 nights, he was tempted in the wilderness. Well, for 40 years, these people wandered in the wilderness and Moses intervened. He's a type and shadow of Jesus Christ intervening. Today, God makes, Jesus makes intercession for us. Moses intervened 40 days and 40 nights. He was on the mountain. He came down. And I like what he says here. So I'm just going to underline it for myself later. He said, it's not even because they're so special, Lord, but because the people from the land which from which you brought them, that's the Egyptians, as well as the Canaanites who are watching. If you destroy them, they're basically going to say the Lord the quote unquote Lord, the great king above all gods. Oh, Mr. High and Mighty. He wasn't able to sustain them. Oh, they all died. And so Moses is saying, this is about your reputation to the world as well. The wicked are watching. And sometimes God preserves us for the testimony, for the testimony of his glory as seen through flawed, broken, rebellious people. No judgment. I myself have been the same, but God's reputation is not dinged by my character, and it's because of God's mercy that he is continually glorified, even amongst the worst people. And be assured, the world is watching, and they are looking for reasons to judge God and reject God. So I, prayerfully, I will never be that reason that they have. But God, Moses intervened here and reminded God, there's more at stake here than just these people. It's because of the world. The world is watching too. Hallelujah. Okay, let's finish up with Deuteronomy chapter 10. Now Moses is continuing here. At that time, the Lord said to me, cut out for yourself two tablets of stone like the first and come up to me on the mountain and make an ark of wood for yourself. I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablet, which you broke, and you shall put them into the ark. That's the ark of the covenant. So I made an ark of acacia wood and cut out two tablets of stone, just like the first, and went up to the mountain with the two tablets in my hand. 
he wrote on the tablets, just like the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spoke to you on the mountain out of the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. I turned around and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark, which I had made. And there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. Now my Bible has a little parenthetical statement here, a little vignette with an explanation that says, The children of Israel set out from Beeroth of the sons of Jachan of Mosherah. There Aaron died and was buried, and his son Eleazar ministered in the priest's office in his place. From there they journeyed to Guguda, and from Guguda to Jabatha, a land of rivers of water. At that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the Ark of the Covenant to the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister to him, and to bless his name to this day. Therefore, Levi has no portion or inheritance with his brothers. The Lord is his inheritance, just as the Lord your God promised him. That's a little side vignette my Bible has here in Deuteronomy 10. It's Deuteronomy 10, 6 through 9, layering an explanation of God as the inheritance of those who minister to him. That principle is still alive and well today. We are the kings and priests, according to 1 Peter 2, 9. We are the kings and priests of the new covenant. We draw near to God. We minister to the Lord and we thereby are partakers of his inheritance. It's not the same inheritance we have through Christ. Of course, we are heirs according to the promise. This is a worship and praise inheritance where God shows himself as provider. We've seen that through all the explanations of Leviticus and the way that the laws were played out for the Levites. We've seen that God honors the lifestyle of worship, that those who minister to the Lord have a special inheritance that's not amongst the other people that are still in the amongst the people of God. God is attracted to those who offer the sacrifice of praise. God speaks the language of sacrifice because he himself gave the ultimate sacrifice of his son. So that's what that little interlude is saying in that parenthetical statement. As for me, I stayed on the mountain like the first time, 40 days and 40 nights. And the Lord listened to me at that time also. The Lord was not willing to destroy you. The Lord said to me, arise, take your journey before the people so that they may go in and possess the land, which I swore to give to their fathers. Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to love him and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I'm commanding you today for your good. Indeed, heaven in the highest heaven belong to the Lord your God and also the earth and all that's in it. I'm going to get out my highlighter. We saw in Psalms quite a while back, we saw in one of the chapters of Psalms that the earth belongs to the Lord and all of its fullness. Well, Moses is saying here, heaven, the highest heaven belong to the Lord and also all the earth with all that's in it. That's why if God needs to remove some pagans off the land who have destroyed the land and their disgusting wickedness, he can do so. It's his land. We're all just borrowers or squatters or children of the inheritance and whatever God wants us to have, we get as his children according to our inheritance with God as our father. Yes and amen. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them and he chose their descendants after them, even you above all people as it is today. Therefore, circumcise your heart and do not be stubborn anymore. For the Lord, your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great and mighty, the fearsome God who is unbiased and takes no bribe. Whew. He executes the judgment of the orphan and the widow and loves the foreigner, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the foreigner, for you were foreigners once in the land of Egypt. You must fear the Lord, your God. You must serve him, cling to him, swear by his name. He is your praise. He is your God who has done things for you, great and fearsome things, which your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt with 70 people. And now the Lord, your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. That is such a powerful thing to reflect on. I'm going to highlight here Deuteronomy 10, 21. He is your praise. He is your God. He has done for you these great and fearsome things, which your eyes have seen. That is the Hebrew word for praise. 
Tehillah. It's an extremely specific word, and it's the only word for praise that is ever used with the possessive sense of God. He is your praise. And elsewhere throughout the Bible, when Tehillah is used, God says, Tehillah is mine, my Tehillah, because Tehillah is a new song. It's a spiritual song, and it comes from your testimony. It comes through your gratitude, and it's as an offering and a sacrifice of praise. Every believer should sing a new song to the Lord because that is a special possession to him. Psalm 22, 3 says he inhabits the Tehillah of his people. So when Moses says, he is your praise, he's He's your new song, and that is based on on your testimony, your personal testimony. And that's what Moses is saying here. He's done for you great and fearsome things, which your eyes have seen. Your eyes have seen. You have testimonies of God, and so do I. And we should always be willing to sing, whether it's alone in your car, in your morning, in your devotions. Yes, sing. That's what Tehillah is. It's a praise song to the Lord, a new song no one's ever written before because it's written from your spirit, from your testimony of God. That is a powerful verse. I use it as an anchor scripture for the way of the worshiper. He is your Tehillah. Great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. I'm going to link to more about Tehillah below. And that is the end of our Old Testament reading. You can check out that resource later when you have some time, if you want to dig deeper about the seven Hebrew words for praise and Tehillah. Let's go over to the New Testament. Reading today, Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 21. When we last left off, Jesus was confronting some Pharisees about them saying, Yo, you, he said, I came eating and drinking and you've rejected me. But John the Baptist, he came not eating and drinking anything and you rejected him because at the end of the day, you don't see yourself as sinners in need of a savior. Much earlier, Jesus had said, I didn't even come for those who don't think they're sick. I didn't come for those who don't see themselves in need. I came for for the sick. I came for those who know that I have something by which they can be healed. And then we saw that the woman came with the anointing oil and she sobbed. She fell at Jesus's feet and she just broke. She was so broken in her heart for all that God had done. He had forgiven her of such tremendous sin that she broke this jar open and she just laid there and she stroked his feet and cried and wiped him with her hair in gratitude and in worship of Jesus for all he had done for her. And then we now see women who accompany Jesus. People are coming, people with means and with wealth are supporting Jesus's ministry. And some of them are even in Herod's own household, showing that you can be in the upper echelons of a corrupt society. And if you are a believer, you are positioned there for God to do a work. And who knows who these people told about Jesus? Maybe they didn't tell Herod, but they might have told other people. And reasonably so, we can draw that line and see that there were people where the gospel is spreading. It's underground at this point in time. And people are positioned by God to be there for such a time as this. So now Jesus is talking about the parable of the sower. When a large crowd had gathered together and people were coming to him from every city, he told this parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. As he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on a rock. As soon as it sprang up, it was withered away because it lacked moisture. Some at last fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other seed fell on good ground and sprang up and yielded a hundred times the amount sown. When he had said these things, he cried out, He who has ears, let him hear. His disciples said, what might this parable mean? He said, to you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but to others, they're in parables so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. He's referring to the Pharisees here, people who are exactly like the sower and the seed was just explained. They, they hear it. They don't perceive it. They're not connecting with it because their hearts are hardened. He's not saying I'm concealing it from people so that they don't understand. He's not saying I'm trying to prevent people from understanding. He's saying it's fulfilling a prophecy. That's what he's quoting, saying hearing they're not going to get it because they don't want to get it and seeing they won't believe it because they don't want to believe it. That's what he's referring to there. Now, the parable means this. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are those who hear. Then comes the devil who takes away the word from their heart, lest they should believe and be saved. 
Those on the rock are the ones who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root, for they believe for a while. In the time of temptation, they fall away. That which fell among the thorns are those who, when they've heard, go out and are choked with the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. But the seed on the ground that's good are those who, having heard the word, keep it in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. No one, when he lights a candle, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but sets it on a candlestick that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and revealed. Take heed, therefore, how you hear. For whoever has, to him will be given, and whoever has not, from him will be taken even what he thinks he has. Then his mother and his brothers came to him, but could not reach him because of the crowd. Someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. And he answered them, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. Jesus's response here to his family showing up when he's doing the work of the ministry reminds me of when his parents showed up in the temple when he was 12 years old and he'd been missing for three days. His mother said, what? He said, well, son, what are you doing? Why, why are you here? And he was teaching in the temple. And he said, don't you know, I must be about my father's business. He's hasn't changed his mind. And what he's saying here is, I'm a still about my father's business. And if you're about my father's business as well, then we're family. We're a spiritual family. And these were his natural family. And not every time in our lives does our natural family come along and they're not always part of our spiritual family. And Jesus is showing there's a different way to count those who are like-minded and those who are your true family versus those who are in the natural. Now, Jesus's family, ultimately, they become followers of Jesus. They realize that he's the Messiah, but he's showing other people that there is a loyalty among the brothers and sisters of God as well when we are united through the work of the Father. That's the end of our New Testament reading. Let's go over to the Psalms. Finishing today, Psalm 69. It was a difficult Psalm when we read it, then we started opening it, reading about such difficulties that David was walking through. And he recounts them how bad they are, how horrible it is, saying it's because the zeal of the house of God, it had consumed him and people hated him for that. And we see much later, Jesus says, people will hate you because of me. Well, David was consumed with the zeal of the house of the Lord and people didn't like that. And he was suffering because of it. Then he flips the narrative and says, but as for me, even though all these things are happening and he names them again, I wait on the mercy of God. He said the abundance of your mercy, but as for me, those are four incredibly powerful words that we see throughout scripture. People of God saying it's this, it's this, it's this, it's bad. It's hard. It's all the things, but as for me, but as for me changes nothing. God is still good. I won't turn my back on him. I'll turn my face to him. I'm going to find my strength there, my watering there, the, the faith that I need. I'm going to remind myself of who God is. That's how people of God fight their battles. So now we're reading in Psalm 69, 19, uh, verse 19 through 36, finishing this Psalm, this agonizing Psalm. But as for me, you have known how I am insulted and my shame and my dishonor and my adversaries are all before you. Insults have broken my heart and I am sick and I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, I found none. They also gave me poison for my food and in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. May their table become a snare for them. May their security become a trap. May their eyes be darkened so they do not see and make their sides shake continually. Pour out your indignation on them and may your wrathful anger overtake them. May their habitation be desolate and may no one dwell in their tents for they persecute him whom you have struck down. And they recount the pain of those you have wounded. Add punishment to their iniquity and do not let them come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written along with the righteous. But I am in poor and in pain. May your salvation, O oh God, set me secure on high. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hooves. The humble will see this and be glad. And you who seek God, may your hearts live. For the Lord 
hears the poor and he does not despise prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and he will build the cities of Judah that they may dwell there and take possession of it. The descendants of his servants will inherit it and those who love his name will dwell in it. That's the end of our reading of the Psalms today. There was such rich imagery through here that's prophetic of Jesus Christ. When Jesus cleansed the temple, he talked about the zeal of the Lord consuming him. We saw that in yesterday's reading in Psalm 69. And then today he talked about they've given me poison for food. And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. That's what happened to Jesus when he was on the cross. I love reading the Bible this way with such richness through the Old Testament and the New Testament and the Psalms and the Proverbs. You see all the connections and it's all a testimony of Jesus. It's all prophetic and it's real through the human journey of real people that worked out their salvation, their faith in the Lord with fear and trembling. It is powerful to look into God's word and see you're not alone. And here's how you get victory. Yes. And amen. Let's finish up with a proverb reading today. Proverbs 12, two and three, a good man obtains favor of the Lord, but a man of wicked devices, he will condemn. A man will not be established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous will not be moved. So far in our last couple of readings, we have seen a lot of speech about the righteous not being moved. That doesn't mean the world or the enemy won't try to move you. Certainly those seasons come to us all where we feel very moved. But God said the righteous will not be moved. And there are spiritual principles there to fighting those battles. When we feel we're being moved and God said you're not going to be moved, whose report will you believe? We put our faith and trust in the name of our God. That's the end of our reading today. Day 88 of our 365 days in the Bible. I'm so glad that you joined me today. Tap like on this video. Keep yourself accountable. Check out the resources below if you want to continue studying forward. I'm so glad that you joined me today. I'm Alicia Purdy, publisher of The Way of the Worshipper. We're going to close with a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father. You are good. Father, when we feel moved, we know that we can cling to the rock that is higher than I, and we don't have to be moved, though the storms will come and the winds will blow. Father, we're going to anchor down to our solid rock that is Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, that you speak sacrifice. You gave the sacrifice first, the better sacrifice. You are worthy of the sacrifice of praise. You've put a new song in our mouth, a hymn of praise to our God that many would see and would fear and would put their trust in the Lord. We commit to you today, Lord. We will sing a new song for great and and mighty things which we have seen and heard that you have done. Glory to you, Lord, the great King above all gods, the Lord of lords, the King of kings. We bow before you and you alone, and we will never be moved. Thank you, Father, that you fight on our side. Help us, Father, every moment of every day to continue to stay at your side. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow, everybody. Bye-bye.